Good morning. <laughs> My name is Lenny Mock, and I'll be the worship leader today. It's amazing how, over time, a person's perspective can be altered. Once you put everything in the right perspective, even bad times can be an opportunity to refresh your appetite, your desire. You must look within for value, but must look beyond for perspective. Perseverance and perspective until victory. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Central Oregon. I already said this, but my name is Lainey Mock and I will be your worship leader today. We have some rugs and some alternative seating um, in the front here and in the back. So um, the RA space is also open if you might, if your little ones might want to like recharge, get some energy. Um, whoever you are, however you find yourself right now, know you are welcome here. Good morning. If you can rise in body or spirit, we're going to do our gathering song this morning called Come Sing a Song With Me. Come sing a song with me. Come sing a song with me, come sing a song with me, that I might know your mind, and I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find, and I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. Come dream a dream with me, come dream a dream with me, come dream a dream with me, that I might know your mind, and I'll bring you home when hope is hard to find, and I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. And I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. Come share a rose with me. Come share a rose with me. Come share a rose with me that I might know. And I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. And I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. Our child sliders today are Ryan Mock, my dad. Yes, he does exist, I promise. Um, and Addie Holland, my best friend. If it's about different personal perspective, should I explain mine descriptive? What if you always resist? Although different views truly exist, I've been trying. Still, there's a lot of misunderstanding. It's like I always turn right when you turn left and ask me for a fight. I have no place to speak up more, and it tires me just like before. So I decide to do my thing without your involving. No surprises. I don't want to do any surpasses. I just want to do my own thing that I'm keen on without you knowing what I'm working on. Silently, privately, I'll work for myself, by myself. It takes much time, just like writing this rhyme. You'll understand, someday, not now. I'll gladly let you know. Let's rise again. As we sing Spirit of Life.
Good morning. I'm Chela Sloper. I'm the Congregational Life Facilitator, and I have today's announcements. And um, firstly, I want to welcome everyone who's here today. I know we have some visitors, and there might just be visitors visiting us on Zoom as well. Let us know that you're here if you want to sign up for our weekly um, email. It's called an All Congregation Email, or the ACE. You can do that in the, um, there will be a form in the chat. And for those of you who are here today and think you might be coming back and want to know more about our congregation, do sign up for the ACE. And the art team has a banner in the gathering hall. Now, the thing about the banner is that on September 10th, drumroll, <laughs> Reverend Scott returns. <laughs> and again, thanks to our worship team and uh, the sabbatical task force for keeping us on track and the train moving forward. But it will be nice to have Reverend Scott, the engineer, <laughs> back um, driving the train. Um, anyway, that will be September 10th. The in-gathering is one of our big sort of celebratory days here in the life of our congregation. And we anticipate it's going to be a full house. So this means we're going to ask folks to squeeze in. I know this is two weeks away, but I just want you to be thinking about it. We're going to ask you to squeeze in. We're also going to ask you to carpool if you can. If you don't mind walking across the street, there's going to be parking available at Roughwear and also just on the streets over there. We just, it's really going to be a big day. And also, you can contribute to its deliciousness by bringing frosted cupcakes, muffins, savory or sweet, and if you really like scones, bring scones. <laughs> and there are sign-ups on the kiosk for um, not only for those treats to bring, but also if like baking is not your thing, we ha you can come at 8.30, help set up. You can help clean up after. We need more dishwashers that day, even though we're probably not going to be using plates, but all the same, we want to cover all those bases. So the, the banner that the art team has for you to sign is to welcome back Reverend Scott and his family. So stop there after the service. And then also in the gathering hall today, there's a table set up for the auction. So the auction is going to be the first weekend in October. And I found out how to submit things for the auction. Go to the ACE, there's good information. I have submitted my four pies. One of them will be gluten-free, just FYI. Now, Soul Matters. Okay, so Soul Matters begins in September. This is a monthly packet that we have of different readings or links to, you know, videos or articles about a theme. The theme for September will be welcome. If you're interested in signing up for the Soul Matters packet, there's a sign up for that at the kiosk. There's also the sign up for the small groups. So the small groups meet once a month and it's a committed, uh, we ask that you make a real good faith commitment to make that kind of a priority for the year. But there are six different times, either in person, on Zoom. So look at the kiosk for that sign up as well. For those of you who are Dungeons and Dragons people, <laughs> I just wanted you to know that because it's coming soon, it's first Thursday of the month, um, so the contact information that's in your skyline, you can contact Nathan or Steph or raise your darling hands where they are. There they are. So I just want you to know that that'll be the first Thursday in September at 6.30. And lastly, yeah, about the auction, if you're also interested in serving on the auction team, the auction team would love to have additional help. And with regard to additional help, on September 17th, again, just to mark your calendar in your mind, we'll have a community fair so that you can learn more about the committees and teams, especially those that are active in the congregation, especially those that are looking for new members. Okay, that's a lot. So let's all take a breath. <sighs> Blessings on your day.
I'm Amy Brock, and I'm the Director of Religious Exploration for Children and Youth, and it is time for our time for all ages. So if you're young or young at heart, we invite you to come and join us on the rug because we have a story to share with you. And while you're coming, I invite you to think about the word perspective. We don't have an official Soul Matters theme this month, but today we're exploring perspective. So think about a time when maybe you went on a hike or just a walk, and maybe you were going up to a space that had some elevation that was kind of high. And when you got there to the parking lot or the trailhead, you parked your car, or you sat in the car that your parents parked, and you looked up, and maybe you had a thought. Now, we all have different thoughts, but I can imagine that our thought might have been, wow, that's really high. That's going to take a long time. It might be really hard. Or you might have had a thought that was more like, that's really exciting. I can't wait to get to the top. And those different ways that we see things and think about things are what we mean when we talk about perspective. And with that, Lainey's going to share our story with us this morning. Today's story is, do you believe in unicorns? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, look, it's a horse with a hat. I think it could be a unicorn in disguise. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's just a horse. A horse who woke up with messy hair. That's why he's wearing a hat. <laughs> Tell me this. Why would a unicorn want to hide its horn? You think unicorns like to keep people guessing? I think it's just a horse whose favorite color is red. <laughs> or a horse that doesn't want the sun in his eyes. Do you really think it could be that easy to find a unicorn? Let's be realistic. It's probably a horse trying to keep its head dry. I do think a horse would take its hat off for tea, though. So I suppose it can't be completely, entirely certain it's not a unicorn. Oh, thank goodness. Now we'll know for sure. It's a <laughs> What is it? <laughs> Hold on a minute. Maybe you can only see unicorns if you believe in them. <laughs> and so ends our story today. So we all get to have different ideas and different thoughts about things, depending on where we stand looking up at a mountain or maybe what we see when we look around us, whether we realize it or not. Thanks for listening to our story today. Before we share our children's covenant, I have a very exciting announcement. Our RE classes are beginning in a couple of weeks, and to be able to have classes for children and youth at UUFCO, we have to have some adults to support us with those programs. Now, we have regular teachers each week who guide the classes, but we need help from almost everybody that is available or wants to help um, to come and support our teachers and to just be with our young people. It's a really exciting experience for everyone. You get to make new friends and maybe learn some new things that you hadn't thought about before from a different perspective. So if you are interested in spending some time with our young people this year, there is a sign-up sheet at the kiosk and you can put your name and email address on there. And what happens when you do that is that it lets me know that you're interested and I'm able to reach out with you to you and give you the information that you need about how you can sign up to support us. So you can help us one time, you could help us once a month, um, you could be on our call list for when people are sick and can't come in. Um, there are lots of different ways to support. So you're not committing to anything by signing up, you're just letting me know that you might be available to help if we need it. And I'll get you all the things that you will need to be able to do that at some point this year. So don't forget to check that out before you leave today. And with that, we will close our time together with the Children's Covenant. In this place, I am kind. In this place, I am loving. In this place, I am a friend to the earth and all animals and people. 
this place I am loved. Hold up, guys, I'm short. Okay, next is up next up is our um offering. So hold up. <laughs> um We will now receive today's offering to support the programs and ministries of this congregation. Through these gifts, we, will, we strengthen the bonds of our community and nourish the possibilities of the future. If today is your time with us, is, if today is your first time with us, you're welcome to pass the basket. Your presence is a gift to us.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Byrne. I'm a member of the pastoral care team. Wait, this just in. So are you. From David Brooks, the essential moral act is casting a just and loving attention on other people. This is the kind of attention that asks, what are you going through? And cares about the answer. And today's joys and sorrows from, oh, by the way, if you have one that's unspoken, don't forget their candles on the side of the sanctuary for you to, to light and get that started. From Annis Henson, my brother-in-law Tom died Monday night in Kalispell, Montana. Tom's last brief hospitalization was unexpected, but diabetes can be a grueling disease. We grieve with my sister, Coralis, who has lost her beloved husband, and Collins, very fine stepdad. They've been Tom's caregivers for years and are exhausted. Our September Montana vacation with them will be a time for reflection and companionship. Please hold Jenny and Tom Sponsler in your hearts and thoughts. The current update is that our beloved Jenny is declining more rapidly than before. May she have a peaceful transition. Their son Brian is coming from Colorado this weekend. Please do not contact Tom at this time. He's under a lot of pressure, as you might understand. From Diane Darling, my joy is that two of my favorite people, and I, have birthdays coming up very soon. John McKee, Jayla Sloper, and myself. May their birthdays be joyful. My other joy is that our youth group is strong and inspirational. And finally, from Noreen Halberstadt, not finally, first, <laughs> <laughs> Noreen deserves tremendous credit for keeping these services going. From Noreen, my daughter Jaslyn had her 30th birthday this week, no one's that young, and I'm so proud <laughs> of all her accomplishments, her values and how she lives her life through serve, love and service. Now Dick and Randy will be singing something I forgot, sorry. <laughs> Why don't we rise in body or spirit?
Next up is meditation. So, um, sorry guys. Um, so first I'm gonna read a little thing and then we're gonna ring the bell for an intro, let you guys sit for a little bit, um, meditate, and then I'll ring it again after about two minutes, two to three minutes. Therefore we do not lose heart, but through, but wait, though are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but for what is unseen is eternal. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18. Our first speaker today is Maggie Miller. She has been attending UUFCO since 2006, which is longer than I have been alive. <laughs> oh. Well, it wasn't that long ago that I started here, but that makes me feel my 82 years pretty good this morning. <laughs> One takes a lot of roles in life, at least I have, and with those roles comes suitcase full of surprises. When my 12-year-old son was shot with a 30 6 in Baker City, I took on the outside position as anti-gun in rural eastern Oregon. Not a real popular stance to take. When my oldest son became a quadriplegic, I spent three months at a rehab hospital in Colorado learning the under culture of the disabled, um, which is again a marginalized group. In August of 1966, I married a soldier who was stationed at Fort Ord in California. Some of you may remember that place. Um, he spent a year in Vietnam. Being an army spouse for a couple years, I learned how the world turns around. There's a whole military community out there that lives in a different dimension. If you've been part of it, you know what I'm talking about. If you were a military spouse, as I was in 1967, and you lived off base, you lived with shame and disgrace. Um, my spouse was putting his life on the line and half the country would have preferred him dead. At least that's what I thought. Neither of us held a popular position. I felt isolated, alone, and conflicted. From there, I went on to be a law enforcement officer's wife for eight years. Uh, actually, five of them, he was a deputy here in Deschutes County. Um, again, did I say isolated, alone, and conflicted? Again, another spot that I was not part of the mainstream community. 
being a peace officer's wife. When I came out to myself as gay in 1961, I had a different perspective from those around me. I lived in the shadows, in a subterranean culture, in a hidden world not allowed to be myself, in the straight world. I was a PE major at Sacramento City College. We had a special room in the gym that only PE majors would go to. People wondered what went on in there. I'll tell you now, it was boring. <laughs> uh, PE majors didn't talk about being gay. Um, not even to each other. Being gay, I was there for two years and I never heard the word gay in that PE major's room. Um, oh, once I heard it on the field in San Jose at a hockey, I was playing the right wing on a hockey team and somebody yelled, say gay or something and I felt so welcomed uh, <laughs> just to hear the word. Um, they, we, were, we closeted ourselves and we were closeted by others. Most lives were spent hiding. It was a different, different perspective. You could have your heart broken and there was no one to tell, not even your best friend who was closeted from you. Um, we didn't talk to each other about being gay. There was an understanding uh, about straight people that they were the common enemy and we had no common ally. Um, not even with each other, because I had a gal that picked me up every morning for college and drove me to college. She was gay, I was gay, we never talked about it. Um, in the 60s, being gay was a sad and lonely life. Once I sent away for a magazine to be delivered in a brown envelope and hope nobody noticed that the brown envelope even came. Uh, it was called, it was a magazine or a booklet called The Well of Loneliness, and that pretty well says it all. One of the most imprinting times for me was when I spent some months on welfare in 1974. I had left an abusive relationship and moved from Bend, which was 1974, it was too big to raise my kids in. So I moved to Baker City in Eastern Oregon. Did I say Eastern Oregon? Yes. I would dress up in my Lake Oswego clothes and speed through the front door of the welfare office at 1768 Auburn Street. I still remember the address. Praying to some God that no one in town would see me walk through those front doors. I would shop at the local Safeway after dark to use my $48 in food coupons. Did I say I was in Eastern Oregon? What was it like being a welfare mom? It was most of all humiliating. Well, from welfare to Little League, a Little League mom, I made the transition. It was two different worlds. I got off welfare in three months. It took me having three jobs to do it. I remember our first welfare check of $232. It was sent to the wrong address and we had to stay in the sleazy ranch motel some days longer. I will never forget the shame and humiliation. It still hits me today at, at this time of my life. Anyway, in conclusion, I have to be short here because there's two other speakers where I could go on and on. I've walked in a lot of moccasins in my life. Um, actually, being a Unitarian is a bit living in a different perspective. Um, socially and physically, I'd say we're considered mainstream in our social views and our physical views. Um, but in matters of religion, I think some of us sell, sell them, seldom share our deepest spiritual beliefs, even with those that we share a household with, um, let alone whoever we fit next to in the fellowship. So I'd just like to say that it's something to ponder um, our, our sharing and not sharing of our deepest spiritual beliefs here uh, is something to ponder. And that's all I have to say for now. I thank you very much. Our next speaker is Pat Kelly. Kelly? 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 Um, 
he's on worship team with Stevie and I, and um, he's just going to share a little bit of his perspective as a teacher. Well, thanks to Lainey and Stevie for having such a great idea for a service on perspective. And thanks to Maggie for sharing such an amazing perspective. And so my prompt was, uh, have you ever held a perspective that was different from someone around you? And how did you deal with that? And my situation was at work. And uh, I'm a teacher, and I care an awful lot about my job, and I want to get it right. But before I get to the specific situation at work, let me tell you a little bit about my perspective so you can understand my perspective. I wasn't always a teacher, and before I was a teacher, I was a geologist, and I have an engineering degree. I chose geology because I love being outside, and now I work at a little virtual charter school that involves a lot of time in front of a computer. But that's okay because there's part of my personality that loves being behind a computer and making stuff. In fact, one of my favorite thinkers and, uh, is Kevin Kelly, who started Wired Magazine, and he wrote a book called What Technology Wants. So I'll have some Kevin Kelly quotes sprinkled throughout this. So I, I love being outside, and I love being in front of a computer, learning a piece of new tech, which is kind of a weird combo, and it's a little bit of a dichotomy. So anyway, back to the situation at work. I'm in a staff meeting at my little virtual charter, and we we're having a discussion of our mission and our vision, and it devolves pretty quickly into a conversation about the ills of the traditional education system or the traditional classroom. Too many students, behavior problems, it's not flexible enough, it's cookie cutter, too much standardized testing, yada, yada, yada. And it took on sort of a self-congratulatory feel and everybody had a good time piling on. So me being pretty idealistic, and I just got out of my teaching degree, I piped up and said something like, well, what about student collaboration and learning from each other and doing hands-on labs? We should be honest about what's missing from our model. Very awkward silence. <laughs> you know, it didn't lead to a productive conversation, at least it didn't then. And I felt frustrated. And then the exact opposite happens where I go to a conference with science teachers and they start piling on online education. Too much screen time, not enough collaboration, it's too easy, yada, yada, yada. And just, you know, I start defending the online school. I say, you know, some students need flexibility to wrap school around a passion, or they need time away from the intense social environment that school is, or the classroom is, or they need to be able to work at their own pace, things like that. And again, sometimes it doesn't lead to a productive conversation. And here's what kills me. Both of these perspectives are right. I feel caught in this dichotomy. I want to know what kind of education is better. I've tra seen traditional school be a terrible fit, and I've seen online school be a terrible fit. I've seen both of them be an amazing fit, depending on the student and the family. And it just depends on what situation we're talking about. It depends. I hate depends. <laughs> don't, don't you? My science and engineering background, you know, I want an answer. Is it A or is it B? I want an A or B that's always right in every situation. But there's a lot of situations where A and B could be right. It just depends on this perspective and who we're talking about. I hate depends because it means that I need to do the work of digging a little deeper, being more precise, and asking all these questions. What's the situation? Where are you coming from? What's your life experience? What brought you to this perspective? Kevin Kelly has a great quote that says, you only see 2% of another person, and they only see 2% of you. Attune yourself to the other 98. And here's another quote. You can reduce the annoyance in any, someone else's stupid belief by increasing your understanding of why they believe it. Getting to that understanding, the 98% can be hard work. 
especially when I want to say, this is the answer, let's move on. You know, I'm not an expert at much, much, but the things that I do know a lot about, it strikes me as I'm likely to say when somebody asks me a question about them, it depends. And the more you know about something or someone, the less simple things get. The more everything depends, the more messy it gets, the more dichotomies you bring up. Here's another quote from Kevin Kelly. Whenever there is an argument between two sides, find the third side. The second part of Lainey's question was, you know, how did you deal with it? How did you deal with this perspective that you didn't share with everybody else? Well, I think I'm still dealing with it. I'm, I'm still trying to sit with it depends. I'm still trying to dig for the particulars. I'm still trying to find that third side. I'm looking to have productive conversations with people that transcend this online learning versus in-person dichotomy. It occurs to me that this third side business is how I found UU. UU is a little bit of this third side type of solution. Many beliefs, one fellowship, no dogma, just principles. You mean there's no rules? You, might, you mean I have to like dig up other people's perspectives and triangulate and use my values to find an answer? Oof. But that makes sense given our focus on love and connection, seeing each other deeply, getting to that 98%, and listening. So thanks for listening to my perspective today. It's working now. Um, but Lainey is going to be the next speaker. But to break it up a little bit, we're going to sing a song, Tis a Gift to be Simple. So let's stand together. are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Isaiah 55, 8. Sometimes I feel like my perspective's wrong, not because it is, but because it's different from everyone around me. No one ever really asks me about per my perspective. People just ask me like my opinions, not how do you see this, just which one do you like more? But I think our opinions are based on our experiences and how we perceive the world. I've never had to worry about racism or gender identity or even sexuality. I've always just been ordinary. Not in a bad way, though. I love my life, and I'm so grateful not to have to worry about issues like that. 
I'm white, I'm straight, my family isn't poverty or anything. I think when I was about 11, I realized that the way I view the world is based off my experiences and that I needed to broaden my understanding of many things. I started noticing bullying more and chose to, chose to be kinder in response. I started noticing that people who looked different than me were treated differently and not for the better. Before I want to continue, um, our pastor Scott Rudolph used to tell us on worship team before we did, before we wrote anything, that you want to speak from a scar rather than a wound. Pat, Pat reminded me of that recently when I realized what I wanted to talk about today. We all have wounds and scars, and to be able to share the story behind them is vulnerable and delicate. My biggest scar is my eating disorder. I'm very open about what happened to me, you know, medically speaking, but I don't think I've ever shared the mental part. I was always aware of the fact that we all have different points of view, but it was never really pointed out to me until it was. Stevie, close friend, she once asked me, this is how we came up with the service, have you ever had a perspective that was different than everyone around you, and how did you deal with it? Thank you, Pat, for thinking I could come up with a question like that, but it was not me. It was Stevie. <laughs> no, I thought I've always based my, per, my perception of, off of everyone else's. I thought about the question for a really, really long time. Turns out I lied to myself. When I was 12, I started creating unhealthy eating habits. It got better, and by better, I mean easier to hide. Two years passed. Lots of therapy, hospital visits, doctor's appointments, stuff like that. It got bad and then worse. I was fainting regularly, my hair was falling out in chunks, and it was harder to breathe. My heart grew incredibly weak. February 26th of this year, 2023, I was admitted to a hospital in Portland. I hated it, I thought I didn't need it. It's hard to seek help for yourself at the cost of others. It really, really is. Um, oh, where was I? Oh. I couldn't help but feel guilty for my parents having to move to Portland. Like, of all places, Portland, really? <laughs> <laughs> the financial burden of the hospital and leaving my best friend of five years alone just here in Bend, like, it was sad. It made me want to believe that I didn't need the help. I did. My parents, my doctors, Addie, and my brother, Ryder, they saved my life. They could see me struggle more than I could. They could see my struggle more than I could. Their perspective saw that I needed help, even when I couldn't see it, even when I didn't want to see it. I fought, I fought really hard to get out of there, to fix everyone else's problems. Instead, they came together and fixed mine. I was discharged in April of this year. I don't remember what day, sorry. Um, sometimes you need to stick to your opinions, but sometimes uh, the perspective of, the other is what you, of others is what you really need. Don't be scared to share your opinions with others. It might be just what they need. They helped me in ways that I could have never imagined. And for their perspectives, and for you taking the time to listen to me today, I thank you all so much. As we transition into the week, and into work and school, I invite you to take the words from Henry Ford with you. If there's any one secret to success, it lies in the ability to get another person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. Um, what? Um, now we'll do the unison reading of the covenant. <laughs> uh, love is the spirit of this fellowship, and service is its law. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. <laughs> 